so we're in this series called Like Jesus. And throughout the next couple of weeks, we're going to just really be leaning in and focusing on some different parables that Jesus told. And and I love this uh, series because through these parables, Jesus was trying to reveal to people what the kingdom of God was like. And we see uh, time and time again, not only the response and the attitude of the father, but we also see some maybe some uh, issues that we have as humans, right? As we try to continue to follow Jesus and become more like him. And uh, Pastor Tyler did a great job preaching out of Luke 15 last week. And understand Luke 15, it is a series, it's a trio of parables, right? We have the, the uh, wait for it, it's coming to me. We have the lost coin, we have the lost sheep, but then also we have the lost son. And so we're really going to be focusing in on, on a couple of verses uh, this week. And so if you turn with me to Luke chapter 15, the, this week we're going to focus in on three verses in particular, and it's verse 20, 21, and 22. And this is what it says. It says, so he got up, this is the lost son, and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Would you pray with me as we continue to look at God's word today? Jesus, we just come to you. Father, we were expectant to see not only your attitude and response to this last son, but Lord, we're just excited that as we dive into your word, that we can become more like you. Lord, we ask that you would empower us and convict us to be more like you. Lord, that as these words are spoken and and, and as these words leave me, that they wouldn't be my ideas or, or my thoughts or feelings, but instead it would just be your word and what your Holy Spirit has for your people today. Father, we ask that as we leave this place, we shine as a bright light that is burning for you. And Lord, that is light and bright enough for everyone to see. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and in your name we pray, amen. Is anyone here a bad driver? Okay, okay, just me. Good to know, good to know. Uh, My mom's here, and she taught me how to drive about 10 years ago. And when we still drive together, she holds onto the handle because she thinks we're going to die. That's how bad of a driver I am. And uh, if you know anything about driving, then you know that there's some rules to the road. If you're thinking or asking the question, yes, my wife does drive 90% of the time when we drive together. But... We have some rules of the road, right? We understand that when we drive, our hands should be at 10 and 2, right? We understand when there's a stop sign, you should come to a complete stop. Let's see if I get anybody there. We understand that you should use your turn signal when you're merging in the lanes, right? These are simple rules of the road, but sometimes we don't always follow them. Right. Sometimes we just get a little bit busy or a little bit preoccupied or or maybe we're just going a little bit too fast and we forget about these things. And what's interesting is that we can apply that same thought or that same rationale to when we're reading scripture. Am I right? Right. Sometimes we're just going through it because like our Bible app told us to do it. And all of a sudden we get to the end of the chapter and we're like, wait, what happened? I don't remember. Right. And we go back and read it again. And it's like, wait, it's just not. Working. And so uh, what I want to do is I want to give you a rule for the road as we read the Bible and importantly, as we go through these parables for the next couple of weeks. There's two words that I'm going to give you. And these words, they're kind of Bible college words. Um, and so they might seem a little bit weird, but, but just follow me for a second, will you? So the first word I want you to say is uh, exergesis. Can you say that? Exergesis. Okay. And the second word I want you to say is isogesis. Perfect. Now see, understand exegesis or exegeting, this is a great way to study the Bible. It's a great way to lean into God's word. The word actually means it's it's allowing the Bible to lead me to what God wants for me. Okay? Now, eisegesis, it's the second one, it's the I is the E-I-S-E-G. Okay. That one is where I want the Bible to go, that's where it takes me. 
Now understand, exegesis, this is kind of how it works, right? We read the Bible. We figure out what it says. Then we figure out why it says that. Then we figure out how it connects to the overall story of God. And then finally, we can apply it to our life. When we do eisegesis, what happens is we isolate the word of God to one scripture, to one phrase. We take our bias or our thoughts and we inject it into that verse. And now all of a sudden it's out of context. Can I give you an example? If you're having a rough day, if you're going through a hard time and you think you just need a win, what are you going to read? You're probably going to read David and Goliath, right? And you see David, a young man, and he has a sling and it hits a giant in the face. And you leave reading that passage feeling encouraged. You believe that you can take on a giant. And I believe you can as well. But the point of that passage isn't the fact that you can take on a giant. It's that while you're in the midst of giants, God will be faithful to you. And so that's the difference between when we exergete, we get what God actually has for us versus when we, uh, iso- when we have iso Jesus, then it's only what we care about. So as we go into God's word today, I found myself eisegeting this message, right? If you don't know my story or my past, I was very far from God. I was uh, doing things I shouldn't have been doing. I was not living a life that was good. I wasn't uh, honoring God in my ways. And when I came to God, it was very much like the lost son parable. It was a sinner that was being given grace and love and mercy and came to know him in a good way. And so this is true, like this, that part of this passage, that's accurate, right? But what happens is that when we only focus on the son, we lose sight of the father. And so what I hope that we can do today is that we can focus on the father as we go through this parable of the lost son. Amen. So let's read it together. It's going to start in verse 11, and we're going to go all the way to verse 24. This is what it says. He also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Understand, as, as we continue going to this, this is a Jewish man who, like, literally, he's not even supposed to be around pigs. And so he, at this point, is at his lowest of lows. It continues on verse 16. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food. And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and he went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, can you say long way off? I lost my place. While the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran through his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. So they began to celebrate. Now, as we hear this parable, we have to remember what verse one said, right? 
Verse 1 said that the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining because Jesus was sitting with sinners and tax collectors. And so this verse specifically, all three of these parables, they're about the reason why Jesus was willing to sit with those who were lost. It's about the fact that the Pharisees and the tax collectors, they had an opinion, they had a thought that these uh, men and women who were far from God, they had already chosen their lot in life. They've already made the decision to rebel against God, and they're not worthy of God's recognition. But Jesus is very clear through these three parables that he does care for them, that they do matter, right? And you might be sitting in here today and you're saying, Andre, like that, that that's for me, right? I, I'm far from God and like, and I've been continue to follow him for year after year, but I still have sin that I have to deal with. And I'm thankful for the grace of Jesus. Can I tell you, I am thankful for the grace of Jesus as well. But we need to understand if we're only thankful for the grace that we receive, then we have neighbors and a community that's never going to know him. We have to go out and we have to run to the people and tell them about the same grace that we have. If you don't remember anything else I say today, I hope that you can remember this. Is that living like Jesus requires us to run to, to reconcile and to restore those who have rebelled. Living like Jesus requires us to run to, reconcile, and restore those who have rebelled. See, when we go back to verse 20, it says, while he was a long way off, the father ran to his son. Now, in our culture, running has become normal, right? I have friends and they post like their route from their Apple Watch showing how they ran that day. And I'm like, I don't care, right? Uh, like running, if you ask me, like running's weird. I got a bad knee and so anytime I run, it hurts. But there are people that they just love to run. It, for them, it's like a meditation, right? And this is how crazy our world is. People will run in a race and they'll pay for it too. Understand, I, I looked up the word marathon. Do you want to know where it came from? The word marathon came from an old Greek story about a man running from Athens to Sparta asking for help to fight the Persians. It was life or death. People run now to get a t-shirt. It doesn't make any sense to me. But running has become normal in our culture. But it was weird for this father to run. Understand, if this father needed to get somewhere quickly, he would either send a servant to run for him or he would schedule that his horse would be prepared for him. That was the normal for him. For him to actually run out to his son potentially could have been damaging to his reputation. People would have saw him running and said, well, that's weird. Maybe he's losing money. Maybe he can't afford his horse to be boarded anymore. Maybe he doesn't have enough servants to run for him anymore. But when he saw his son, he wasn't worried about his reputation. He was worried about the son's recognition as part of the family. And so we, the first point I need you guys to know is that we as a church are called to run to rebels. We're called to run to rebels. See, sometimes we, we get into this place where we understand that there are people in our community who have legitimately rebelled against God. When we take their actions, thoughts, and opinions and put them side by side with God's word, they don't line up. And unfortunately, what happens too often is we as fleshly sinful humans within the church make the decision that they're two fleshly sinful humans. You understand what I'm saying? Right? We, we create an opinion where they're too far from God, where, where it's not going to be worth it, or I can't do it, or it's not going to work. Can I tell you? The job is not to put up a barrier, but instead to run through it. The job is to run to those who have rebelled against God because the same grace that we have received, they need. Come on. If we've been given this grace and it's a gift of God, let's share the gift. Let's give it to people that are hurting and broken and in a messed up world. Because I can tell you, even when we accept Christ, life doesn't get easier, but man, it gets better. When we accept Christ, we no longer have to deal with this world on our own, but we get to enjoy the gift of God, which is his presence. 
right? It's not just a reward in heaven. No, no, no. It is relationship with the Father right now. Can I tell you, this isn't in my notes, but last year when Alicia and I, when she miscarried our first pregnancy, we didn't know how to respond. We were broken. And about two weeks of crying and tears and sadness and not knowing what to do, we finally just sat in our bed and we listened to worship music. And all of a sudden, we're, pr- we're praising Jesus, that song from Maverick City Promises, and saying that God is faithful, even in the midst where it didn't seem like it. And so that was the hardest part of my life that I've ever experienced. But God showed up in that moment. And so if that's the goodness that we've received, then man, there are people in our community that need that as well. So can we be a church that runs to the rebels? Can we, regardless of what they think, regardless of our differences, regardless of what separates us, let's come to them and encourage them and love them the same way that Jesus did. Now, I'm not saying we need to be, uh, uh, I'm not saying that we need to be affirming, right? Even Jesus said, I, I am going to sit with tax collectors and sinners. But he sat with them knowing that his mission was to bring them closer to God. So we need to have an urgency, We need to have an urgency about us because the truth is, Jesus tells us in the book of Matthew, he says, the day and hour that I will return is not known. It's only known by the Father. The other day I was listening to a pastor and he was saying, and Jesus is going to come back right now. It didn't work, right? But that's the reality that we live within, is that Jesus can come back at any moment. Jesus could come back right now if he wanted to. Because he's going to reconcile his people and recreate the earth in the way that he intended it to be. He's going to bring us back paradise on this planet. And I'd hate to be the person in paradise knowing that there is room for one more. I'd hate to be the person in paradise in the house that the Lord has built me in knowing that my neighbor doesn't have one. I'd hate to be the person in paradise knowing that there's so much provision given to me that no one is going to go hungry, but the person on the side of the road isn't there. Come on. We have to have an urgency about us because heaven has plenty of resources and God will show up in people's lives. And we have to make the decision to get them to Jesus now. Amen. Maybe as I'm saying this, you're saying like, well, Andre, you know, uh, I, I just don't like talking about Jesus to people, right? Maybe you're just like, well, I, I just don't know enough Bible, right? Or, or I'm just uncomfortable. Can I encourage you that running starts with a step? Running starts with a step. And if we're going to be honest, sometimes it starts with a crawl. Our pastors are our Pastor Tyler Soley, he does CrossFit, and I've done CrossFit before. It's the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> what they do is they make you like lift weights, and then they make you run, and then they make you do pull-ups, right? And when I've done a CrossFit workout, I was lifting weights, and then I died and came back because the Lord resurrected me, and I had to crawl to get the run started, and that's okay. See, we have opportunities here within our church to help you start ministering today, right? You have the opportunity to jump in one of our kids' classes. You know that a five-year-old and a 25-year-old have the same needs? That's supposed to be funny. (laughs) Do you know if you wanted to jump in our youth ministry with me on a Wednesday night and start serving some young people, I can tell you a 15-year-old and a 60-year-old, they have exactly the same needs. A six-year-old doesn't want to go to work anymore. A 15-year-old doesn't want to go to school anymore. That's it. And we get to stand in the midst of them and minister to them. And as we talk to them about Jesus, we will become more comfortable talking to others about Jesus. Right? Maybe you're just like, well, Andre, I don't like young people. I get it. I spend every week with them. They're not always pleasant. But starting this fall, as we launch our life groups and our classes, jump into a life group in a class and you can sit with somebody that's your age that is like in the same season of life with you. And you can start to have conversations with them about Jesus. And this will prepare you for the time coming. Amen. The second point that I need us to know is that we have to reconcile the relationship. Right. When we look back at verse 20, what does it say? It says that he saw his son from a long way off, so he ran. But then what was his response? 
Did he say, oh, so glad you're here. Did he say, it's been a while. Did he say anything of that nature? No, no, no. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. He, he, the relationship was already reconciled before the son even showed up. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get into an argument, it doesn't always go the way I want. And usually after the fact, I think about what I could have said instead. Right? Have you ever been in this place where there's conflict, it's unresolved, and you start making the director's cut version of what you would have said? Right? Right? <laughs> You all of a sudden, you have like scriptural background, cultural background. You might even have deleted some of the words that you said in person, if you know what I'm talking about. And all of a sudden, you have this perfect, perfectly laid out logical explanation of why you're right. And then once you get there, then you go to the next step. You start imagining what their apology is going to sound like. Right? You, just, you see the tears in their eyes, the quiver of their lips. It's just like, I'm so sorry I did it, right? We start imagining what their response is going to be. Can I tell you that Jesus, in this parable, the Father does not even give a reason for why he was right. And he doesn't even expect an apology. The fact that the Son showed up was good enough. And I... I want to ask the question, sometimes we get so offended by the stupidest things, right? I I, I thought about this the other day, and if we were to make a grid, okay, and and the uh, vertical axis was like offense, right? And then the horizontal axis was impact. Then there should be a line right in the middle, and if you're above that line, you're crazy. If you're below that line, you're sane, okay? I'm not saying this as your pastor. I'm saying if you, if we were doing counseling, and if you brought this to me, and I was like, eh, it's below the line, you're fine, right? And so understand, okay, big impact. Somebody burns down your house. High offense. You're in the clear, okay? You're not crazy. Follow me. Medium impact. Your boss takes credit for your work. Medium offense. It's going to be okay, right? Under the line, you're not crazy. Above the line, you're kind of crazy. But then this thing happens where there's low impact. Like literally, it does not affect our life at all. But we create the biggest offense, right? We can see things on Facebook where somebody posted uh, not even their thought. It was just somebody else's thought that's gone viral and they're resharing it. And we become so offended, We can have conversations of with people and their political agenda is different than ours, and we become offended. Can I tell you, we live in a democracy, and because someone voted differently than you does not mean that they elected the president. Like, they were not the swing vote, and you should not be offended at them. But we become offended at some of the lowest impact things. And my question is, if we decided... If we made a decision that we're, as a church, are no longer going to be uh, offended by these low impact things, but even in the midst of offense, because like the scripture is clear, offense will come. In the midst of offense, what if we were a church that stopped, we waited, and we prayed before we even responded? Because I believe that the Holy Spirit, he brings reconciliation to our heart. And so when we need to reconcile with others, it's already done. We don't need an apology. We don't need anything from them. The thing that offended us, we don't even remember it because the Holy Spirit has wiped it from our mind. What if we were a church like that? That when we encountered people, when we encountered people, it didn't matter what had happened in the past because we know that they're a son or a daughter of Christ. What if we had that response as a church? If the Father has it and we're trying to be like Jesus, then we should try to live that way. And as I've been talking, as I was writing this sermon, I really felt the Spirit just impress upon me that there there might be people in this room where you really felt like your family's rebelled, right? Your spouse, maybe your kid, a grandson, they've rebelled against God. And your heart is so angry. I would just say for this next week, would you make the decision to be responsible for reconciliation? Not the way that you want to do it, right? If you want to do it right now, you drive to their house, you kick down their door, and you just baptize them right there and hold them under a little bit longer. What if we made the decision for the next week, 
We're going to spend time in prayer, praying that God would show up in that person's life. That we wouldn't have an expectation uh, of us going to them and reconciling, but instead we would give the reconciling to the Holy Spirit and that he would move in their lives. And then as, uh, and then we would get joy from God knowing when they show back up in our life. And then we get the opportunity to run to them. Amen? The final point that I have for you today is that living like Jesus is going to require us to restore the righteousness. As we look at the last, uh, I think it's verse 22 there, verse 21 and 22, it says that he ran, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. Verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22, this is beautiful. The father's response isn't like, yeah, I know, but it's okay. The father doesn't even hear his apology. He doesn't even respond to his apology. He just immediately gets to restoring his son to the way that it was before, the way that God intended it to be. He says, but the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. The father seeing his son, this is the way that I imagine it. As the son has traveled from a far off land, he's only had one pair of clothes on his body the whole time. It's probably a couple week journey. And so I believe that he's most likely sunburnt. He's probably covered in grime. His clothes are ragged and dirty. He probably smells terrible and even smells like pigs. His father still embraces him. And he, his father sees him exactly where he's at and says, no son of mine will look like this. And so he says, bring out the best robe, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. What this makes me think of is oftentimes we, can, we, we celebrate evangelism within the church, right? I can't tell you as we returned from summer camp, the question I got from so many people was how many kids said yes to Jesus, right? And, and I just want to be blunt with you real quick if I could, right? I love evangelism. I love lost souls coming to Jesus and that we're going to spend an eternity, to, eternity with them in heaven. But I think as a church, we can't allow people to show up to Jesus and reconcile their relationship, but not get rid of the grime, Right? We have an understanding that when we say yes to Jesus, we are sanctified, we are made clean, but then we go through a process of discipleship and sanctification. And so we as a church, we can't just have people say yes to Jesus and then let them stay there. That's no different than birthing a baby and then leaving it at the hospital for somebody else to take care of. We have to be a people. We have to be followers of Jesus that make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And a disciple is somebody that follows Jesus for a lifetime. If we have people say, yes, I'm in, that's great. But if they stay here for the rest of their life, it's not, it, it doesn't matter. The goal as our, as for us as a church isn't that people would stay here, but they'd get closer to the cross. They'd get closer to Jesus. They say, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to leave behind my past. I'm going to leave behind my habits. I'm going to leave behind my brokenness. And each step, I'm going to get closer to, closer to the Father. And this is the thing. We might be here in our journey with Jesus, right? And we have to run to the rebels, take them by the hand, and walk with them every step of the way. This is what I need us to know before we leave today. You can't give someone your righteousness. As we look at this scripture, the father says, bring the best robe. And remember earlier in the chapter, it says that he took all of his possessions and traveled to a different country in verse 13. So he wasn't saying, bring my son's best robe. He wasn't saying, bring 
the best robe you can find in his room or in the attic or in the servant's quarter. No, no. He said, bring me the best robe. I can almost guarantee you that the robe was in the father's room. And you and I, the reality is, is that we've been robed with the, with the righteousness of God. We've put on God's righteousness and we've taken off our own sinful ways. And we can't take off our shirt and give it to somebody else spiritually. But the Father can every single time. And so our job isn't to make people more like us. Because if I'm going to be honest, I'm pretty messed up. The reality is that our job is to encourage people to become more like Jesus as we become more like Jesus. Let's be encouraged that the, the cross where Jesus made that sacrifice for us, where his blood ran out, that blood was atonement for our sin. See, because of our sin, we were required that we would have to pay for our transgressions, that we would have to pay for the mistakes that we've made. But when Jesus spilt his blood, the father saw that and said that the debt has been paid. And so because our debt has been paid and there's more than enough to go around, let's run to the rebellion. Let's run. Let's reconcile their relationship with God and be responsible for it. And finally, let's continue to walk with them hand in hand as they become restored to the way that Jesus intended them to be. Can I encourage you with one final thought today? The purpose of Life Center is that we would bring life to every life in our community. We would bring life in Jesus to every life in our community. We believe that we can do that by loving well, by equipping and building lives, and one other value that I can't remember off the top of my head. It's on the mission statement sign outside. But as we do this, let's remember that it's, not necessarily the job of the pastors to minister to the people. No, no, no. It's our job to equip our congregation, our church, for the ministering of the people. And I want to just let you know, ministering is hard. Can I tell you, running, it takes energy. Reconciling, it takes empathy. And restoring is going to take endurance. And if we're honest, we're not going to last long if we're not empowered by the Holy Spirit. 